Arguably the main selling point of Martin Scorsese's gangster movie The Irishman is not the incredible story, which tells the tale of the disappearance of Teamsters union leader Jimmy Hoffa, but who's in the film? The movie reunited Scorsese with Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci, two actors with who he has made some incredible movies, and the trio haven't worked together since 1995's Casino. Incredibly, The Irishman also marks the first collaboration between Scorsese and legendary actor Al Pacino, Michael Corleone himself. The Scarface actor was touted to star in numerous Scorsese projects over the years, and the two seemed tailor-made for each other, but it just never happened until The Irishman. Let's not forget, though, that there's also another major reunion that happened in The Irishman. The film stars veteran actor Harvey Keitel, who actually first worked with Scorsese before even Robert De Niro. He is the original Scorsese muse, having starred in Scorsese's earlier films, including the director's student projects and his breakout film Mean Streets. Incredibly though, the two haven't worked together since 1988, over 30 years ago, making his appearance in the film one of the more low-key but important reunions. Speaking of low-key, One of the reasons there wasn't as much fanfare about Harvey Keitel being in The Irishman may have been due to the fact that he isn't often considered to be in the same acting talent bracket as De Niro and Pacino, but mainly it's pretty much because he isn't in the film much. Keitel has one main scene in which he is with both De Niro and Pesci, and he is scattered throughout the rest of the movie in different places, including Frank Sheeran's Appreciation Night, where almost the entire main cast make an appearance. In total, Keitel's screen time doesn't add up to much more than a few minutes, but it's a wonderful bonus to have him in the movie as he really completes the set of veteran actors from classic crime films. Despite his lack of screen time, much like with many other characters in The Irishman like Fat Tony Salerno, Crazy Joe Gallo and Joe Tough Guy Glimco, Keitel's character, Angelo Bruno, has a very interesting backstory. Bruno was a mob boss who ran the Philadelphia crime family. The Sicilian immigrant would run his family with relative peace for around an incredible 20 years, an extraordinary amount of time given how often the profession would end in death or imprisonment. Bruno did not suffer any lengthy prison terms, and from 1959 when he became a boss, he was at the head of a crime family that acquired success for two decades without much trouble. Bruno managed to avoid the media scrutiny and police surveillance that often plagued mobsters. Unlike most of his contemporaries, and unlike his primary scene in The Irishman suggests where he says he would be willing to let Frank Sheeran be killed rather than talk to him and investigate about a laundrette he was attempting to blow up, which, according to the book I Heard You Paint Houses, did happen in real life, interestingly, Bruno is thought to have largely favoured negotiation and bribery than violence. One of his more famous decisions was sending future boss Little Nicky Scarfo, a volatile and unhinged gangster, to Atlantic City because of his violent ways. The Philadelphia mob was rampant with infighting, which often led to blood-soaked battles as numerous gangsters fought for control. Bruno's term as boss was one of organisation and order. He ran his family as he would run a business, and he would pursue meetings and reconciliation as a conclusion to disputes rather than a bullet to the head. And in fact, his methods earned him the nickname the Gentle Don or the Docile Don, and he had close ties with the five New York families. During Bruno's reign, violence was replaced by profit, and Bruno's lucrative rackets involved having local politicians in his pockets through bribes, as well as the gambling scene in Atlantic City. However, despite his success, Bruno was faced with a bloody and brutal end. As The Irishman, a film always concerned with death, morality and the bigger picture, tells us through a freeze frame and a few lines of text, Bruno was killed by a shotgun blast to the head as he sat in his car outside his Philadelphia roadhouse. The identity of his killers is a topic that has been much debated. For one, Atlantic City, fertile ground for organised crime, was strictly Bruno's territory, and though he allowed members of the much more powerful five New York families to run rackets there, 
Some may have wanted Bruno and his heavy-handed management of Atlantic City out of the way. However, his assassins are largely thought to be members of his own family. Bruno may have run a powerful and successful mob, but there were those who were quietly displeased with the way he ran things. Narcotics was strictly a no-go for Bruno. He did not allow his family to take part in the drugs business. His subordinates would be witnessed with itchy fingers to lucrative fortunes that were being made by other families as a result of the drug trade, and many wanted a piece of the action. What made many even more furious is that Bruno is thought to have allowed other families to carry out drug deals on his turf as long as he got his cut. Some might see this as him protecting his own family, but clearly not all shared this line of thinking, as on March the 12th, 1980, at the age of 69, he met his vicious demise. Some might say that Bruno's death at the hands of his own people started a curse for the Philadelphia mob. What can't be denied is that the family descended into the very same chaos that they were in before Bruno's rule, with numerous killings and murders one after the other. The first was Antonio Caponegro, also known as Tony Bananas. He served as consigliere to Bruno, but it's thought that he was the one who betrayed Bruno and ordered his murder. Just a few weeks after Bruno's death, Bananas was found in the trunk of a car, beaten, shot, naked and dead. Some reports say that he also had bills stuffed into his mouth and his anus to symbolise his greed. It's thought that the commission, the governing body of the mafia, ordered his killing because he killed Bruno without permission. Numerous other members of Bruno's crew who took part in the assassination conspiracy met with fates similar to Bananas. Phil Tester took over the family after this, and he appointed Nicky Scarfo as his consigliere, the notorious mobster who Bruno banished all those years ago. But as those who have seen The Irishman will know, Tester was eventually murdered after around a year by a nail bomb at his own home. The murder was carried out by Peter Casella, Tester's underboss, and a capo called Frank Narducci Sr., in a bid to take over the family. Tester's death was followed by Narducci being shot dead and Casella fleeing from Philadelphia after being banished. After a war within the family, Nicky Scarfo ended up assuming control of the mob, running it with violence, bloodshed, and interestingly disloyalty, as he ordered the death of Salvatore Tester, the son of Phil Tester, who was Scarfo's friend and mentor, sparking a great distrust in Scarfo from other mobsters. This new image for the Philadelphia crew, in polar opposite to Angela Bruno's methods of leadership, would continue to be plagued with violence, death, family members becoming government informants, and the imprisonment of Scarfo, and it's thought that today the Philadelphia mob is a shadow of its former glory days, where business was booming and peaceful largely in thanks to Angelo Bruno. Thanks for watching.